My name is Jai Curry, and I'd like to welcome today a very special guest, Craig Hamilton. Craig has done many amazing things. He's doing um, fantastic stuff in the mental health space at the moment. He's written two Australian best-selling books. He travels around Australia, speaking to thousands of people around mental health, um, raising awareness through his own story. I've had the privilege of working with him on a short documentary earlier this year, One Conversation, and we now are working on a feature documentary, The Promise, um, to raise awareness on mental health and suicide prevention um, and hopefully help save many lives um, now and into the future. So, Craig, welcome. Hi, Joy. How are you going? Yeah, I'm good. Good? Yeah. Um, Living the dream, mate, actually. <laughs> fantastic. So... Just before we get into it, I just wanted to just touch on just some um, statistics that I've read that I think it's actually it's blown me away to think that this is happening in Australia. So every day, nine Australians die from suicide. It's estimated that over 65,000 Australians attempt suicide every year. 65,000 Australians every year attempt suicide. 75% of those who take their own lives are male. And on top of that, there's 72% of males that don't speak up or speak out with, when they have mental illness. Pretty damning statistics. Mm. And that's why the work I'm doing and the work you're doing is important. And you talked about – they're shocking statistics. The, the number of, you know, 65,000 attempts, um, the, the number of calls to helplines every day – that's staggering and these statistics do not include those who attempt suicide and survive. Uh, they don't include um, those that think about suicide and there's far more uh, suicidal ideation than anyone would know. So the, you know, suicide claims more lives, more Australian lives every year, in fact, more than double the road toll. Mm. So we're talking about something that needs to be addressed and it hasn't been addressed for a long time. And uh, we're getting better, but it is still the elephant in the room. Definitely. Do you, um, just for those who might not know your story, do you want to just touch just quickly on kind of what you went through and then where that's brought you to now? Well, over 20 years ago now I had a... A dreadful bout of depression. I was 37 years of age. I'd never experienced anything like that before. I had no tools to deal with it. I didn't even know what I had was depression. And it was awful. It was a, a dreadful time, seven or eight months, which led to suicidal thinking. It started slowly uh, through, you know, lack of sleep or una being unable to sleep, disrupted sleep, unable to concentrate, con uh, confidence down, uh, diet affected, totally fatigued all the time, stress levels through the roof. Um, then there was just constant anxiety as well, which I'd never experienced before. So this were, all these symptoms were happening and there were... Uh, despairing thoughts, I'd had negative thoughts for a long time, then finally suicidal thoughts and didn't get help, didn't get any help at all until I was suicidal. So I look back at that time now and I shake my head and think, how did I become so unwell? How did I get to become so unwell before I sought help? When you were in that place, did you find, like, did you think to yourself, I should reach out to someone or did you think... Someone's like people won't care, people won't listen, or what? Like, why did you not reach out to anyone? I was too embarrassed to reach out to anybody. Uh, it wasn't the male thing to do. There's still such a stigma, a huge stigma around any sort of mental illness uh, that still applies today. I think we still see the numbers, the raw statistics tell us that there are still a lot of people who have mental illness, who have depression, who don't get help. And the, uh, the, the largest majority of those people are men. Mm. You know, something like 72% of men who experience depression 
don't get help. Mm. Now, I was one of those 72% and, and my mental illness, my uh, depression got very serious before I got help and it's because I was embarrassed, because I was um, ashamed in many ways and because of this stigma that prevented me from getting help. And when you get that depressed, when you become that depressed that you are suicidal, it takes intervention from someone, it's almost like it's it's so serious you won't get through it yourself. Very difficult to get through it yourself until somebody reaches out or, or you do get to the point where I'm so desperate I've got to talk to someone or get yourself to a doctor. And did your like did you do you think you only got um, on that path of recovery because of the incident at the train station? Well, the incident at the train station at Broadmeadow was was different again because my diagnosis is bipolar disorder, which involves not only uh, depression, but it involves mania. And in my case, with bipolar 1 disorder, psychosis. So I was put on medication for the depression. Once I finally sought help and got to a, a GP, the medication was uh, a, an antidepressant which fueled a high. Mm. It fueled a manic episode, which is very important to to talk about because if you have an underlying bipolar disorder, then the medication, the, the straight antidepressant medication, has the potential to initiate a, a high. Uh, a, mani- a, a manic episode and in my case when I was at the Broadmeadow railway station just before the Olympics, that's what happened and very quickly that shifted into a psychosis and, uh, you, you know, you lose your grip on reality at that at that time um, and you, you're in all sorts of strife. You're in all sorts of strife and I was and, you know, became – my behaviour became very erratic on the, the train station when, when that happens, the police were called and I was um, taken to the the psych hospital at James Fletcher uh, in, you know, for those in Newcastle, the Watt Street, it's the Watt Street Psychiatric Hospital and very quickly diagnosed with bipolar disorder and I was in there for about 14 days. So in short, that's my story. Since then, have you had any other episodes? Or was that the, the beginning of the road to coming back? Well, it's been, it, it was the start of the road to coming back because I had a diagnosis. And once you've got a diagnosis, then at least you know the, the, enemy, you, the enemy, if you like, or the, the, the issue you're dealing with. At least you know that. Prior to that, I had no idea. But it's not that simple because it's a tricky illness. Bipolar is a very tricky illness. Depression can revisit you. It's not simply a case of, and anyone who's been in uh, Walk That Road knows that it can revisit. You think you've got it beaten. You think your medication's going to work every time. You don't have to change anything and everything will be fine. Let me answer your question. No, I have had I have had other episodes. I've had four other stays in hospital to manage manic episodes and it's always mania. I'm never admitted to, I never have been admitted admitted to hospital with depression. It's always been mania. And one of the great lessons through this whole process has been the need for me to manage that high. Mm. manage the high because if I don't become high, if I don't become manic, I don't get depressed. But on each of those four occasions that I became manic, I came out of hospital and I knew, I knew what was going to follow and that was a depressive bout and it didn't matter what, what I did. I knew I would just have to walk through that. Again, so the key for me to remain well is to, you know, manage the high. So, and one of the stories that you've said that sticks out to me is when you were at the radio station on air and the guy rung up afterwards. Mm. And people hear your story and can relate with it 
going through it if, if they are going through it on their own. Mm. So when you say um, to manage them highs is a big lesson that you've learned from it. How would you say to someone if someone was going through it, like da- do you have daily practices or like things that you've implemented into your lifestyle now to help help that? Well, the number one thing still for me as part of a stay well regime, if you like, and I'll say this to anyone with bipolar one disorder, a bipolar one, to get that diagnosis, you have to have had a psychotic episode. You have had to experience psychosis to get that diagnosis. If you become manic but not psychotic and also experience the clinical depression, that will get you a bipolar two diagnosis. The most important thing as part of the regime is to take medication for it. I can do everything known to mankind in terms of trying to measure or manage my mood shift, and I have tried most of them. The key thing to remaining well and keeping my, keeping myself out of hospital is still medication. So to manage the illness, there's got to be an admission that there is a problem. That's the first. That's the first thing you've got to do you've got to actually admit to yourself this is mine I own this it's my problem it's an illness which I need to treat and manage to keep myself well so the number one thing still for me is to take medication and I know what happens when I don't same thing happens again so uh, it's not pretty when it happens again so I have made a lot of changes yeah made a lot of changes to my lifestyle but I start there first okay just while we're on that because I've spoke to a lot of people that uh, they aren't uh, they, have, they haven't been diagnosed with bipolar but they feel depressed and down and some people that I, these are just conversations that I've had with people and I found medications are touchy when some people find it's very very helpful and have a lot of success on it and other people feel quite hesitant to take it mm-hmm so if someone was hesitant to take it, are there things that you would suggest them to try or to do? Well, the first thing to start to, to, to start to answer that question is it's medication is not something you just walk into the chemist and say, I want some antidepressant medication yep. or I want to manage my high when I get manic and I'll, so I'll have some mood stabilisers, please. This... Once it gets to the stage where medication is prescribed and it becomes particularly in a bipolar disorder and severe depression, these are illnesses for a psychiatrist. Mm. Simple as that. And, you know, I I went through the the phase of, oh, psychiatrist. I don't Mm. like the sound of that. I didn't even like the sound of psychologist because we're talking again about the whole mental health thing which – Many people don't want to walk down that road. I didn't want to walk down that road. But that's what they do. That's their specialty. And if you get a, someone you can engage with and you can respect and you trust, then that's very, very important, very, very, very important because they are able to diagnose properly the what's your – Uh, your best, I suppose, path to take. And getting a psychiatrist is no different to if you have a a heart issue, you go to a cardiologist. Your GP will refer you up to the specialist. And if you have cancer, you won't have a GP looking after that cancer. You will have a GP referring you on to an oncologist. No different. So... That's the first thing that needs to be said. So you get that diagnosis right and then you go to the next the step. Specialist. Does, yeah, the specialist. Does that answer your question? <clears throat> yeah, yeah. The big thing that I guess is incredible about your story is you've turned this experience into such a positive thing. You've obviously done that by writing two books, Australian bestsellers, and now with your seminars you're going around and speaking to a lot of people. Do you have any goals with this? Well... I'd like to improve people's well-being. 
uh, I'd like to have mental illness better understood. I'd like to remove the stigma that's still associated with mental illness and I'd like to reduce the suicide rate. And of all of those things, I suppose, I, I think the first three things work towards the last thing. The first three things, if we can start moving with the first three things, then the final goal is to reduce the suicide rate. And I think we can do that. The, the, the biggest issue, as I see with the suicide rate, as I said before, it's the elephant in the room. No one wants to talk about it. And we need to. We need to. Because the numbers, we talked about the numbers already. The, the numbers for the suicide rate in Australia are horrific. Yeah. Yet, they're not actually coming down. They're sort of being maintained at the moment. And we've also just come out of a period of three years of a life-changing event for everybody on the planet, COVID. That has not been good. For, for mental the mental health of everybody. There's been so many different changes and you throw that all on the top of, uh, you know, the average everyday stress and anxiety and depression that people might be experiencing. But the suicide rate, that's how I think I can make a difference. And there's a, I'm not the only one here that's on this path. Stories are powerful. In the work you do, in the business you're in, you're a filmmaker, stories have a capacity to change. Books have a capacity to make change for the better. And and stories are, are right up there as well. That, that's what we're talking about. Yeah. Sharing stories. And you, you, you shift views. You raise consciousness. And my view on it is that I've got a story. It's not something I live every day. Yeah. I don't live it. The only time, in fact, I live my story is when I talk about it. Yeah. I talk about it. I don't wake up every day and go, oh, look at my back story. Mm. It is a story. It literally is a story, but it's a back story. But that story has the capacity to change people. Yeah. It has already and I'll keep telling it, uh, but it's a starting point. It's a starting point. The next steps have to be um, acted upon, acted upon. And in the time I've been speaking, I've heard some amazing stories from amazing people in situations where it's the first time they've ever shared their story with me yeah. because there's a vulnerability there when I talk about my experience and for anyone there, for a number of people there, they then feel I'm not going to embarrass myself. Mm. The filters come down and it's like I can talk to this guy about my story. He's not going to judge it. He's not going to, you know, um, criticise me. He's not going to feel less of me for uh, talking about this and that's a win that's a win that's a win for both of us mm. we both walk away feeling better T talking about the documentary do you think we should um, create a space where when people watch the documentary maybe at the end there's a like an email address or something that they can reach out to and share their story and start that um, communication. Obviously, we're pushing the promise here, which is going to um, allow people to make to connect with someone in their life. But do, do you think it would be a good idea for us to open something up somewhere online? Or well, to uh, to make this documentary, right, which is the next step forward yeah. with with this story yeah. and this way to get as many eyeballs on this story but also how it's evolved yeah because i don't see any value in just spending an hour revisiting an experience there's enough information yeah 
available now yeah. through two books, yeah. through speaking engagements in every state in Australia. There is content online already. Yeah. There's YouTube availability online. There's social media stuff available. So there's no value in, in my view of, of re- recording and interviewing people all about one story. Yeah. Yeah, it's important. We've touched on it here today, but we've got to take it forward from that. There's got to be what happens next. And sure, a part of that is what happened next for me and what's going to happen tomorrow and the day after. And and I don't plan too far ahead either. That's that's the other thing. Um, It's no point. It's no point. Have a bit of planning there, but the important important moment's right here and now because we don't have any other time. Yeah. Do you think we should push that in the uh, with people to, is to, to come back to yeah. the present moment? Yeah, I do. I do. I think that that's really – now, you're not a psychiatrist. Mm. I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm a bush psychiatrist, I yeah. suppose, put that hat on. But I'm not. I've got no qualifications at all. Yeah. I only have this story and I know how I've rebuilt my life and yep. I know how I've become well and how I remain well 95% of the time. Yep. So there's value in that part of what happens next. But for someone watching The Promise, for someone watching the documentary, I think that's really important. How we do that, how that's set up to have um, an opportunity for someone who does get an impact, a huge impact out of out of watching um, the documentary, then it's like, where to now? Okay, it's it, it, the documentary's hit me, tw- hit me between the eyes. Where do I go next? What do I do? And the, and the premise of the story is make a promise yep. to someone yep. in your life. Make a promise. Yep. Make, you know, find one person yep. and make that promise that if things get really bad, and really dark in your life. Now, you've made a promise to each other that I will call you before anything else happens. Yeah. Hmm. Being a filmmaker um, and seeing so many stories out there, there's so many incredible stories that are life-changing, inspire people, they entertain people whilst doing, but I don't see many of them pushing the next action. And I think that's what this is. what's going to separate this from other stories hmm. is um, – Obviously, straight after there is action to take, mm. and it's clearly laid out, and it's not, it's not something that is going to take six months. You can pick up the phone straight away. It's that instant, what would you say, like response, like that. That result is instant. We don't have to yeah. wait time for it. And I think yeah. that's um, it's going to be really special for people to start connecting with uh, loved ones in their lives just straight away. Well, I think the potential for that to happen is. Huge. Mm. The potential for that to happen is huge. There's potential there for people who have never thought I might need to call Lifeline or I will call Lifeline today. It might be triggering but that's, you know, I would rather have a documentary that someone watches that causes causes is the wrong word, that has an impact that way that is so much to a degree confronting that actually um, enables action or causes action, Mm. causes action to be taken. Because the number of people, and I keep going back to these statistics, who don't get help... Mm. They just don't get help yeah. for a whole range of reasons. And resources is another thing. Yeah. It, it's, we don't have that right. We don't have that right. When you've got – and I've only heard in the, in the past week that I've heard these stories and I've heard them for 15 or 20 years, people going to emergency departments in hospitals. And it is an emergency if you are suicidal. Yeah. It is an emergency. It's no different to someone who's had a head-on collision in a car or had a workplace accident, yeah. uh, crashed a plane, is losing blood, is hanging on to life by a thread. 
when that happens and you arrive at emergency with needing, uh, you know, you need emergency surgery. Mm. Say, for instance, you need emergency surgery. Surgery. You go straight through the emergency department. You jump front, front to the front of the queue, yep. which should happen, yep. and you get treated. Yep. Now, if someone arrives suicidal, genuinely suicidal, at emergency, that happens. I've heard of two cases in the last two weeks where that has happened. Those circumstances have happened and they've been turned around. Really? Really. It's not uncommon, Jai. It's not – it doesn't shock me anymore. It, it – when I hear it, it shocks me that it still happens – it's like there's a judgment call made and I get our health services are are overrun. I get that. I know people who work in health and the, they are, you know, they are heroes, the people who work in health. All our emergency services, they're the heroes. They do the hard yards. They are at the coalface. But if the resources aren't there, and someone comes to an emergency department and they're by themselves and they say I'm suicidal and I need to be admitted here um, and someone makes the call that, well, no, you're not. No, you're not. You're not suicidal. Uh, go home, have a cup of tea, relax, sit down. That's not on. That's not on. We've got to do way better than that. And that starts at you know, services, resources, health, mental health, resources, services are a mess. Mm. They've been a mess for a long time. We do have some great hospitals, beautiful new hospitals, great staff working in them. But when it comes to getting acute emergency help for someone who comes in with a, an illness that is so serious that someone is considering taking their life, taking their own life, then we've got to put them at the front of the queue as well and get them the care they need. I was having a conversation the other day mm. about this and if someone broke a leg now, yeah, friends and family go straight over there, mm -hmm. can I help with the washing, can I take some pressure off, mm -hmm. they go there to support them, mm. they're unwell. Yeah. Someone says I'm not feeling good. Mm. Mm. What happens? Mm. Everyone should be there saying... Can I take some pressure off? Hey, do you want to go for a walk with me later? Do you mm. want do you want some some company? Mm. We should be treating it the same as a broken arm, a fractured rib, whatever anyone else is going through. It's mm. just it's so it's so bizarre that someone can be unwell mentally and people don't look at it as important as a as any other injury. The problem there is it's not that easy. And this is, I think, one of the one of the fundamental problems with acute mental ill health, with acute mental illness. The some of the behaviors are difficult. In some cases very difficult to deal with. And that behaviour can put an enormous amount of stress on a family. Yeah. Can put an enormous amount of stress on friends over a long period of time. Yeah. To the point where it, w it can wear families down, it can wear families out, it can frustrate families, it can make families angry, it can... Families, friends, 
can have a view, rightly or wrongly, that the individual who is mentally ill, has the mental illness, isn't taking enough responsibility mm. for their own ill health. Now, I'm talking over a period of years here. Yeah. An acute case for the first time, a serious depression that family and friends know about, I think that they're going to get the same, generally speaking, the same reaction as or the same level of care that someone with a, with a broken leg would get. I think gener generally that would be the case. But when it becomes second time, third time, tenth time, twentieth time, and that is not a judgment on the family and it's not a judgment call on the individual mm. who is who is mentally ill. But what we need to understand is it's not that simple. Mental illness is complex. Mm. I know it's complex. I've lived through it. Do you think because people understand it's complex and do you think that's another reason why they don't want to speak out? Yeah. It's going to be too, yeah. too much hassle for everyone. Yeah, quite possibly, quite possibly. I think the first episode or the first period of mental illness, then that is quite likely to be the case. In fact, look, I think the vast majority of people that's the case. I, I think the numbers, the statistics stack up. Mm. If 72% of men don't get help, don't ask for help, then there's a very – there's very few people, very, a very small percentage, 28%, mm. that are getting help. I think that the, the, the person who is unwell, the, the person who is experiencing mental illness – may not know how unwell they are. That's the complexity of it. I certainly didn't. I didn't I had no idea how unwell I was. I knew I didn't feel well. I knew I felt dreadful. I knew I felt despairing. And I knew what it was like to feel suicidal. So you sure you know then, once you get to that level, you know you got big problems. But on the other side of it, uh, mania, um, psychosis, that's a tricky thing altogether because certainly with mania, that elevated mood, you feel fantastic. Mm. You feel fantastic. It is the opposite side of that um, uh, with bipolar. So that's the tricky thing to deal with. So it is complex. Mm. It is complex. And I'd be the first to agree with that. And it's still complex today. I, you know, I do talk a lot about this stuff. I have written about this stuff. We are doing a documentary yep. about this. So I don't put myself forward as an expert. I put myself forward as someone who has a story, which we talked about before. Yep. It's a story. It also has a strategy that I've worked on and learnt and, and learnt a lot from to get to a point where I've, always, I've been comfortable talking about this stuff for 15 years or more and I'll keep doing it because of those because of those things we talked about before. I want to reduce the stigma so people aren't embarrassed about getting help. I want to have more education and awareness around the symptoms, around the signs, what it looks like. So I may not have the answers to the complexity. Yeah of the, the illness, but I can tell you what it looks like. I can tell you what it looks like from a depression and bipolarity side of things. So if we, we do those two things and some make some better lifestyle choices, even when we're well, and I want to reduce the stigma, I, I want to reduce the suicide rate. Yeah. I've been, that's been a real focus for the last... Four or five years, it's gone next level to yeah. to this. Well, you know, why are you doing this stuff? 
why you keep talking about this stuff? Why you? Why don't you go and just sit under a palm tree or go and lay on the beach? Because I think I can do more. Yeah. I think I can do more. I'm passionate about it. And once someone gets passionate about something, then they find a reason to keep doing it. Yeah. And they get an energy to keep doing it and a desire to keep doing it. Yeah. And travelling around Australia, speaking to all these people, putting in so much effort, time and passion Mm. clearly shows that. And when you... Well, I love that. Yeah. I love that. I like going to... I love speaking at live events. I love meeting the people who come along and having conversations after. I'm comfortable talking to total strangers. That doesn't bother me. Yeah. And that's what I was going to ask you. What's it like when you've just spoke to a room of people and someone comes up straight afterwards and shares their story and thanks you? Well, it's great. It feels terrific that you've had that impact. And it's even better when someone comes up and says that they're in that place right now, Mm. exactly where you described where I've described that what depression was like and what suicidal thinking is like and you get actually get someone who is in the audience that night that comes up and says, I'm going to get some help and I'm going to get some help tomorrow because I now know that you can recover. Yeah. And I've seen your story. I've listened to your story. So I've got, you know, renewed... Hope, if you like, that by taking some action, then um, that's where I go next. And that's great. You hear that. That's fantastic. Yeah. It's, um, it's one of them things like it's in – it's built into the human DNA to survive and there's people out there suffering, taking their own lives. We need more people like you that are out there mm-hmm. spreading the word doing what you're doing in the mental health space and tell, telling your own story, which is helping other people, um, which makes me just want to ask you, are there any stories that you've experienced while doing this, people coming up and sharing theirs with you that you'd like to share now? Yeah, I'm happy to happy to share those stories uh, without naming anybody, yep. obviously, and I suppose not even naming the town or city where these stories were told because I don't want – it's not my business to be sharing their stories. Yeah. But I'll tell you the the situations. Yeah. So I was in – I think – I was in South Australia about 15 years ago and it was a small town and I did my talk. And at the end of my talk – I was approached by a man who would be about 80 years of age. So you can imagine in his day, the generation that he grew up through, talking about mental illness was not a thing. It was not normal. It was not accepted to talk about mental illness. But he came up and this was one of those conversations that – he told me he'd never spoken about before. And he told me the story of his daughter. And he told me that his daughter was the ducks of her school, straight A student, and she was a nurse and she was the nursing unit manager. So she was managing staff. And one day... She went to work and didn't come home. And he said she took an overdose of drugs at the hospital, knew exactly what to take and took her life. So this rocked the family, as you could imagine. Um, They didn't know what depression was. They didn't know their daughter had a problem because there was no outward signs. And he said, we have now gained some knowledge here tonight. We can't change anything, but we understand a bit more about depression 
and ha- what an, an impact, what a terrible impact uh, it can have on an individual. And the other thing he told me was how it impacted on his wife and on him in the weeks and months and years afterwards. Mm. So they're in a small community and he said we would walk down the street and we'd have good friends change, walk across the street. To not walk past them. No, exactly, to not walk past them. So they didn't have to have a conversation with them. They'd just walk across to the other side of the road. So they were alienated and they were left to their own devices. So they had no support. And you can imagine, I can imagine, that the, the friends would not have known what to say and it would have been too hard yeah. for them to talk about uh, to support them in any way because it's a suicide and suicide wasn't talked about in those days. Mm. So he told me that story and the and he said he'd never spoken about it to anyone before. So that's the sort of thing you can get. I had another example of a, a story, a lady who told me a story who was in another country town in New South Wales this time and... Afterwards, after the talk, she came over, having a bit of a chat, and she had uh, she had a smile on her face. She was quite she was quite happy um, about the night. She said she'd enjoyed herself and learned a lot, and then said, "I wish my husband was here mm. tonight to hear this." And I said. He hasn't made it here. And she said, no, he took his life 12 months ago. So that, again, is just uh, – it underlines the the fragile nature of life mm. and how it can uh, happen. Suicide can happen, does happen. I'll give you one more story that, uh, again, is a country town. I've spoken in a lot of country towns. Yeah, a lot of country towns, small towns, and and I, I'd done a I'd done my talk, and then spoke to a lot of people, which I do after these events. We have a good old chat about a whole range of things, whole range of things. It doesn't have to be mental health, you know. It can be can be the the footy, yeah. which I was involved with as a commentator on the radio for years and so they want to talk about that and that's fine, no problem. And then I'd – there was a a bloke who – he said, I'm 79. He told me he was 79 and he said, wouldn't mind having a chat with you. It's too busy tonight. He said, if you get a chance, can you call me? He said, doesn't matter if you don't. And he gave me his number. Mm. So uh, waited a couple of weeks and I don't throw these things away. You can't call everybody back. You can't answer every email as much as you would like to. Anyway, I, I thought this this bloke was a, a bit of a lark. He was a bit of a bit of fun, this fella. And he, 79 years of age, and he rang me. I said, yeah, how are you going? And he said, I just thought I'd give you a ring to just let you know. I really enjoyed the talk the other night learned a lot and he said it can happen so easily. You can slide into a depression and you can become suicidal when you don't expect to become suicidal. And I said, I know. And he said, I know too. He said, I tried to kill myself last year. Um, He said, genuine suicide attempt last year, 12 months before. And not too many people knew that story. Mm. So it it happens. And I feel quite blessed to be able to... to be able to listen to those stories without judgement and simply with empathy. And I've been doing it long enough now to know that... People love to share their stories when they're in the right place at the right time 
but that I, I can also leave that conversation and not take it with me. Mm. That's important for my mental health. I cannot take those stories with me and be, you know, yeah. lying awake all night and thinking about the six stories that I'd heard that day. Yeah. I can leave them. Yeah. That's not my stuff. My stuff yeah. is to listen yeah. and to, you know, offer some wisdom or some empathy where I can. Yeah. Beautiful. You want to wrap it up there? Happy to wrap it up there. Cool. Well, thank you so much, Craig, for sitting down and having a chat. I'm sure um, a lot of people would have got a lot out of that. And the next thing for you and me is a documentary, Mm -hmm. which we're going to make next year, 2023, and going to save a lot of lives with that as well. So I'm looking forward to it. So am I. Joy? Yeah. Yeah. I might get sick of hanging around you. (laughs) I doubt it. Come on. That could be the biggest problem out of all of this, but I'm looking forward to, to making the documentary. Yeah. And I know it I, I, I know it can because we've made a short documentary already. Yeah. One conversation. Yeah. Which is available now. Should give that a plug. Yeah. You haven't mentioned that. Yeah. If anyone wants to watch um and I guess it does it tells your backstory. Mm. So we kind of um, skimmed over it a bit today. But if anyone would like to Go a bit more in depth in that. Um, you can watch One Conversation, which is a short documentary we made earlier this year. It's available on YouTube. It's available on Craig's uh, website and Green Frog, Green Frog Productions website. Mm. So make sure to check that out. And, um, yeah. We'll see you in 2023. Sounds good. Thank you.